brave leaders turning maybes into realities and building something better for everyone. Now is the time to look to the future and reinvent ourselves today, empowering others to do the same tomorrow. Yes, we know what the future holds and we know how to get there. So let's take charge of the journey today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vikas Pota. I'm the founder and CEO of T4 Education. We're gathered here today at a momentous time in our history. We have so much going for us, but we also have these massive challenges that are posed to us. These massive challenges include what I think is a meta theme in the world that we all should be taking a lot more consideration of, and that is to do with our climate, our environment. So today, we are, we are, we are, we are you are joining us in Glasgow, in Scotland, which is hosting the COP26 conference, which is probably, as Peter says, one of the largest diplomatic exercises that this country, the UK, has undertaken since the Second World War. And it's of that footing that we actually need to think about how we mitigate, how we tackle head on the challenges that are posed. Now, in any event, in any event, in any panel discussion, any speech, you have a starting, you have a middle, and you have a conclusion. And very, very uniquely, I'm going to start with the conclusion, because I know that each and every single one of our panelists and our speakers will agree with me, and this is the conclusion we're going to come to. And this isn't rocket science. It's really fundamental. The fundamental truth is, whatever the question, whatever the question, education is the answer. Whatever the question, education is the answer. Now, joining us here today, we have a, a galaxy of stars. A galaxy of stars that includes Peter Lacey, who is, and I don't want to get this wrong, the Chief Responsibility Officer and Global Sustainability Services Lead for Accenture. We have Charlotte Kirby, who is the Vice President of Global Strategic Relations for Salesforce. We have David Mitchell, who is the headmaster, the head teacher of a school in Scotland called the Dunoon Grammar School. We also have Dr. Rebecca Winthrop, who is um, the co-director and senior fellow of the, the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and we also have three young people who will be joining us, because I think it is their voice that matters the most. There's a statistic that I like to cite, which is the young, there may be 27% of human population today but they're 100% of our future. And that is why we are involving young people in this discussion as well. But without further ado, no event in education should really start without a musical performance. And here we have the students of Dunoon Grammar School in Scotland who are going to kick us off. Over to you. Children of the Moon.
If we can, I would love for us to applaud these very talented children. No matter where you are in the world and you watch this, these are, these are the future and we should be encouraging them to do more. So thank you so much to Danoon Grammar School for that uh, and the students of Danoon Grammar School for their performance. Now I want to come to Peter. Uh, Peter, you are, you're a big cheese. You know, you, you are a big person in the corporate world. <laughs> <It's> what you say. <laughs> <laughs> That's a separate conversation, my friend. Um, and, and what happens is that, you know, in events like this, whether you have um, you know, governments involved, you have protesters on the roads, uh, but you also have engaged corporates, and like both of your companies, actually. And so for the educators that are watching, and I know we're streaming this into a very large Facebook group of 50,000 educators, who are listening to you, what is the relevance of COP26 to them? Well, first of all, thank you very much for putting this session on with us um, on behalf of Salesforce and Accenture and all of us. I think what T4 is doing, building a technology bridge to all of these teachers, and, and I hope you all enjoy the session, um, I think is fantastic and much needed. Uh, so climate change arguably is the greatest challenge we face as humanity. Um, it's not really a challenge that exists even in and of itself in isolation. It touches on what we call the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which span 17 different sub-goals that we need to tackle, from deforestation to the oceans to providing good quality work for eradicating poverty. But climate change, interestingly, is something that interacts with all of those things. Whether or not it's creating floods, whether it's extreme weather patterns, whether or not it's wildfires, and whether or not it is the damage that we're doing to oceans and, for example, reefs. All of that comes back to an integrated, systemic set of changes that we need to address globally. Societies, our economy, governments, businesses, consumers, all of us together. Now, why I think it's relevant to the teachers that are preparing future generations is that we all have a role to play. And I know that you've quoted a few times, Vikas, some of these studies that are emerging. And, and look, it's, I think it's art and science a little bit in terms of being able to predict what the impact is. One study I saw uh, impact, uh, sorry, assessed and predicted that climate education for one student on average would reduce by 2.86 tonnes of emissions per year, their lifetime footprint, because they understand what levers they can pull, whether or not that's buying a hybrid vehicle when they're older on their first car, or whether an electric vehicle, hopefully by then they'll be cheap enough, or whether or not that's thinking carefully about switching off the lights in the house, or whether or not that's giving their mum and dad a hard time about their electricity bills and going renewable. All of these things matter, but most of all, I think that... Our generation even didn't create this problem. Previous generations have created the problem. Our generation, and that includes the teachers, need to help solve the problem. The real problem will be solved by the students that you mentioned are 100% of our future. And I think it is so important that they are informed across not just um, science, but, but, the, but across all subjects, that they understand and have a curriculum that is infused with science, with data, and with economics of what will be the biggest challenge of their lives. I mean, the statistic is quite, quite revealing. It says that if only 16% of high, high school students in high and middle income countries were to receive climate change education, we would see a nearly 19 gigaton reduction of carbon dioxide by 2050. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty humongous. Incredible. So I ask you the question and come, come back to reality. Yeah. What are these two weeks going to deliver for the youth? Well, I think um, you, you know very well that uh, the youth conference, the 16th youth conference, took place before COP26, um, uh, which I think is an important development in itself to make sure that, that, that the voice of young people is part of the discussion. And the, uh, the UNFCCC that, that runs the COP process, I think, has been very welcoming. Um, and what's very, very clear from that group, uh, and I think that represents... Uh, hundreds of thousands of students around the world is that we're not doing enough. Um, and that's also the message 
Uh, I agree with it, firstly. <laughs> so I agree with, with the students. I mean, Greta Thunberg may be the most prominent and visible, but there are many, many students out there that I think are feeling very uncomfortable about what we're doing and the future that we're preparing for them and becoming more aware of it. So I think it's super important that they have a voice. It's super important that they're part of the discussion. It's super important that we uh, rethink education or that we that we infuse more and more of these themes driven by science, driven by data, driven by economics, not just driven by people's opinions, people's preferences, but really driven by the best science available and equip those folks to be able to make a difference in the future. And so one of the things that, um, that has been built in the media narrative, at, at least, is that you know, whilst industrialised countries you know, have gone and created this problem largely, you know, the, it is the middle and low-income countries that are going to pay the price for it. Yes. And so when we think about populations and, you know, and young people in these countries, what can we do to mobilize leaders on this issue, especially in those countries? Well, I think the... the so I'll answer your question directly, but I'll come to it in, in, a, in, a, in a roundabout way, because I think we've just launched today a study, the largest study ever conducted on... Uh, chief executives and their attitudes to um, climate change and what they're finding by way of challenges and opportunities. Um, one interesting point of that was that there was the largest ever uh, Global South representation. So out of the 1,200 that we interviewed, we had 426 from the Global South. And what we heard very clearly from the Global South is that they are feeling the physical impacts of climate change far, far sooner than they had expected. As I said, droughts, wildfires, floods, etc. And to your point, they have far less capacity, not least from the conversations we have with them because of the pandemic. They have far less elasticity in their budgets, corporate budgets, government budgets, to deal with some of these physical impacts that are happening faster and are more widespread than we thought. So look, firstly, we need to deliver on the 100 billion that in 2009 the OECD countries committed. That's not enough, but at the very least, we need to be delivering that. Uh, the last count, it was at about 80 billion and going backwards, not forwards. So that is a very important commitment that we're not making to governments or some abstract idea of countries. We're making to the children and the youth of those countries for the future. It isn't enough, by the way, but it is a start. So I think that is one important thing that needs to come out of COP26. Now, you know, I noticed that um, I don't see a flag for Accenture. You know, you're not a country or a government, you're a business and a, a fantastic consulting business. Now, tell us in terms of what is your interest in this subject? Yeah. Uh, simply because I'm sure those that are uninitiated in this discussion will be thinking, well, what is the role of business in tackling climate change, actually making the link to education? Yeah, so I think they put very simply... Um, we have a, uh, a phenomenal and very ambitious um, CEO who's been in term in role for two years who right from the very beginning and, and conversations with me and with others in our leadership um, and I think it's been the same with Mark yeah. you know Mark couldn't be more deeply committed personally to Mark at Benioff at Salesforce um, that values matter as much as value um, and that actually if you take a quarter to quarter view or a year to year view you're probably not going to prepare your business for the competitiveness of the future and that actually we are living you, you we both use the same term, 360 degree value, that actually increasingly we're not going to be measured on the basis of our shareholder returns alone. And in fact, they become so integrated with your values anyway and purpose that actually they become combined and blurred in many ways. I think the new DNA of competitiveness is going to be, for the next decade, is going to be technology and sustainability. And so we are preparing our business for that. That means the way we operate our own business. Um, so, for example, setting a science-based target, one and a half degrees, net zero by 2025, uh, creating our own offsets where we can't. We just had a session, I think you were here, where we're working with airlines um, to create sustainable aviation fuel, a tough problem to solve. Um, but also infusing it in all of our client work. And for example, we have Salesforce Sustainability Cloud that Accenture and Salesforce put together, literally rewiring organizations to be able to measure their performance differently and engage with their consumers and customers differently. And that's not really what we're talking about today with education, but that is why we're interested. We are interested because it represents our values and what we want to be known for. 626,000 people around the world, average age 26, they're in the group you're talking about. Yes. 
They want to work for a company that represents their values, not just create shareholder value for pension funds and asset, asset funds. So it really, really does matter that values and value are at the heart of uh, business increasingly. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Peter, uh, congratulations on all that you do in this space. You know, today, we also want to bring uh, someone else to this discussion who is joining us from Washington, D.C., and that, that is Dr. Rebecca Winthrop, who is uh, the co-director for the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. Rebecca is probably one of the most, not probably, definitely is, the most influential person I know in education research and in think tankery uh, and putting out good stuff. <laughs> and so, Rebecca, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, tell us, what is, the what is the case for climate change education? Uh, this, this, that forms the basis of this panel and everything that we're talking about today. So please, over to you. Thank you, Vikas, and thank you for the Accenture colleagues for inviting me here. Um, it was very exciting to see and hear, Peter, your comments. Um, and so I am going to, Vikas, you already started qu quoting from our work uh, to make the case, but I'm going to walk you through some of the really hard-nosed research that I have done with my colleague, Christina Kwok, um, on researching uh, the connection between education and climate change and why we would want to um, even look at it as, as something that's useful. Um, and so for all the teachers out there, um, I have just tweeted a link to this um, piece of research that we've done uh, that is called um, Unleashing the Creativity of Teachers and Students um, to Combat Climate Change. And one of the things that we propose um, as a major, um, and I'm having trouble advancing my slides here, um, as a sort of major argument um, is to say that we think uh, every school around the world, and there are millions of schools <laughs> around the world, should um, really embrace a culture of climate action projects. Um, and we put a, a goal out there by 2025, but it'd be great also if we could get it by the, uh, by the time the SDGs are due. And why do we say that and what do we mean? When we talk about every school having a climate action project, the reason um, we say that is because when people talk about education and climate change, they often think about changing the national curriculum, which is important and should be done. And some incredible work is do done by Italy um, and New Zealand to really integrate climate change education throughout um, and build climate aware um, citizens and our young people um, and the skills they need to promote that vision. Um, but that can take 10 to 15 years, as any teacher would tell you, it takes a long time. And there's a huge amount of creativity happening with teachers because of COVID right now around the world and with students. Um, teacher, the schools have been closed, teachers have been left to kind of figure out what they do and teachers are doing all sorts of creative things. And if we could harness their energy um, to really focusing on climate action projects, um, what could we get? One, we could really equip young people around the globe with green civic skills. And when I say green civic skills, this really means um, not only understanding climate change, and but, but practicing how you would go about and getting the really concrete civic action skills that are teachable and trainable and we don't do enough of in our schools um, to really make climate changes in their homes and in their communities and in their schools. And that will create a whole new generation of young people really well equipped to do that. I, what else would you get? You, we know from research that young people are really um, empowered and onto a topic and have skills and evidence and data are incredibly influential at coming back home and shifting their parents' and families' attitudes. We know that from the smoking <laughs> cessation world and many others. So. We also know that when it's a very touchy political issue, which this is in some contexts of the world, not in all, it, the kids are the ones who can bypass that partisanship. Um, we also know that actually uh, it could also help develop green schools around the world. There is a green schools movement um, in the globe, but it is not by far the re every school you could um, Think about all the infrastructure, transport, food, energy, electricity that uh, schools <laughs> use. Um, the U.S. alone serves 7 billion school meals um, annually. And if we, you know, 
every kid in the school and every school in the US was focused on school gardens and composting, et cetera, we know it could make a big difference. There's a great example um, in the UK of Kingsman Secondary uh, School, who is part of the Green Green Schools movement. And they did massive sort of, you know, kids, every kid came up with in groups, teams, climate projects. They did walk to school, they did recycling, they did new energy saving, they did composting, they did veggie gardens. And not only did they save a lot of money for their school, 50K, $50,000, their whole school cost reduced, which is a lot of money for a school. Um, they reduced the amount of trash they sent to landfills by 45%. So just imagine that um, multiplied by many times over. And then of course, if you invest in hands-on project-based learning with real um, climate expertise, it only strengthens what teachers can do over the long run. It's not a one-off. So when we say a climate education project, we mean um, projects that are, are not just you know one hour in a, in a school year, but serious projects. Um, in the US, you could do as I said, composting, and really, you know, think about curbing the impacts of climate change in places like Mozambique, where you really need to adapt to climate change. Maybe you're not a, you know, a source of the problem so much. You could have schools um, really work on, um, you know, marine protected areas of being good, their communities being good stewards of the oceans, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the idea. That's the vision um, and what you could get from it. And I think our major argument, um, not just to teachers, because I think teachers are already starting to do this in little pockets, but is to actually the climate community. And part of why I'm so pleased to be introduced, uh, I'd be invited to speak today, because education has not been a sector that's really been invited in wholesomely, fully, and integrated into the, the sort of overarching strategy for combating climate change, like agriculture, like energy, like transport. Only 26% of NDCs um, you know, even mention education. So these are countries' plans for what they're, how they're gonna address climate change. Um, and so the timing and why this is important, I think, um, Vikas, you already um, talked about this, but we know that there's lots of good um, uh, research to show it can really um, have an impact on the climate. Um, we know also that it can be incredibly um, important for marginalized communities, for um, cl climate justice issues, for those um, sort of in the U.S. it's black and brown communities around the world. It's often um, indigenous communities, communities that have the heart, you know, aren't necessarily creating climate change, but receiving much of the um, impacts. Um, it, this can be a really important way to make sure they are get, getting supported and, and getting the resilient um, resilience skills they need. Um, in terms of what, why, um, why now? Uh, one of the things we know is that um, there is a political moment to do this. We know teachers around the globe are very supportive of this, especially I would say in high. Um, um, emitting countries like the US, et cetera, where most teachers say, I want to, to do more on teaching um, climate change, and I feel I don't have the training and support. We know actually also in the US, using my home country as an example, that it, this is a bipartisan issue. Most parents, Republican or Democrat, want climate change taught in schools. Um, so there is a really good opportunity. Um, in terms of what, uh, what we, suggest in the report on how you could actually go about this. Um, we talk about um, basically four uh, main things um, of like what are ideal conditions for success. Um, one of them is that um, there's also a lot of great, uh, there's, there's a lot of great evidence um, that are from around the world of these types of climate projects and how they work really effectively. So we have an effective model we can scale up. There's also a coalition of ready-made actors standing by. Um, there's many, many organizations, not to mention the Fridays of the Future movement and all other youth movements, student movements, who should be invited in to schools by sc teachers and school leaders to say, come, Bring your movement inside the school. You don't leave the school to, to pursue your um, 
want for for a sustainable planet where you can breathe. That's that that seems crazy to make kids go out to do that. They should be invited in. So th- those actors and there's many other actors around the world from nonprofits um, who are making content free um, to advocacy groups, etc. The th- the second reason that we know. Um, uh, and my slides are really, really slow and shifting, so you guys are just going to have to bear with me. <laughs> um, the second reason that we know um, of w- what makes a good condition for success is that actually school um, systems, so most school systems around the world are led by in districts, so you have sort of a manageable size. We know that's kind of the perfect size to do climate action, but you know the climate community has told us between 10,000 to 100,000 people um, is the right uh, size um, for taking climate action because you can have the same principles around the globe, but what you need to do is really specific to your actual community, and that's sort of the right size for scaling uh, climate um, climate action, and sc- that's the size of a school. School most school districts are in every country around the world. So if we could get a model and scale it across school districts, um, led by teachers, <laughs> supported um, by school leaders, um, involving students, I think it would be incredibly powerful. Um, and lastly, um, lastly the. The last thing I have to say is that this is actually something that I think really involves some just three major three major steps. Um, one is really developing a coalition um, of content providers, um, t- you know, teaching teacher networks who work with teachers. I think the main way to do this is through mentoring of teachers and cross sharing across districts and schools. That can be done rapidly and quickly. You don't need some you know wonderful decree from governments on high, which frankly in this, um, I'm, I'm hoping something will be uh, useful coming out of COP, but it, we, I, at this point, I think we need every hand on deck, uh, the private sector, teachers, schools, school leaders, everybody, because the governments don't seem to be getting stuff done that they should be getting done. Um, the second thing you would need is really, you know, to make sure you are supporting and mentoring and providing teachers, and I would say student leaders, clubs, running clubs, et cetera, with um, materials on how to do project hands-on learning that incorporates climate change action. You could get um, teachers and students together with local climate change scientists or local scientists and adapt some basic curriculum that it, and, and activities that are out there already for free. Um, and then you need to track um, progress and accountability and have some sort of tech mechanism for sharing these lessons so it can sort of spread um, virally across schools and districts. So that's our big idea. We hope people embrace it. Um, and I'd be interested for other people's comments and thoughts. Thank you, Vegas. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And you know, today we have two corporate leaders with us from Salesforce and Accenture, two iconic companies. You talked about everyone coming into the school and welcoming them. What do you think the role of the private sector is in engaging the schools and the education sector in this battle for on climate change? Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I've been a little bit dispirited with the um, progress we're seeing at the governmental level. And p- part of the reason we focused our research here on what can an actual teacher do, an actual student leader of a club do, an actual school leader do that doesn't need um, massive policy change, this is it. I really think that the more um, schools and school districts um, can partner with people immediately, um, whether it be private the companies in, in who work in those local areas or frankly who don't and just care about climate action, I would love to see Accenture or Salesforce or everybody else partnering with major teacher networks and organizations which exist around the world um, to support this type of teacher mentoring and getting a platform going. Um, I think that is going to be the way forward because I'm, I think we need to uh, act where we can um, and the private sector can act more quickly um, than governments, it appears. Rebecca, thank you so much for that response. And I want you to stay with us for a little bit longer because I think you're going to enjoy the next segment even more than anyone else because you have been a thought partner in the development and the launch of something called the World's Best School Prizes that we launched. And but before I say any more, uh, I'd love to sh- show you this video. Please. 
Temperature rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water. So, so I go to Peter. Peter, you know, you've seen the video, you've heard Rebecca make the case uh, for greater action at the school level. I believe you have an announcement to make. <laughs> so over to you. Yeah, it's like the one we've, uh, we've almost prepared earlier. Um, I mean, look, let me first respond to Rebecca. I, I think, Rebecca, that um, intervention was fantastic, really just superb. And, and I couldn't agree more with almost everything I think that you said, Rebecca. I think some things that stuck out for me, the, the very practical nature of projects in schools, <clears throat> in districts, without having to wait for system change in curricula, I think that's exactly the right way to go about things. I mean, the, the other comment I would make, before I'll get to the bit Vikas wants me to get to, um, yeah, is, is actually we're going through the same process in organisations like ours, mm -hmm. where we're actually reskilling and have, helping to rethink skills and knowledge and mindsets and capabilities and motivation in our own workforces. Um, and so, for example, we have uh, within Accenture, we you know as, as consulting and technology, you think about high IQ. Well, we talk about technology quotient, not just intellectual quotient. And now we talk about sustainability quotient and actually whether or not you truly understand the science, you understand the impact on your daily life, you understand what you can do to influence clients and so on. And I know Salesforce has, has similar. So I think there's more to be done in linking the corporate sector um, and, and business on that. Because it sounds to me a very similar dynamic. And we see so many of our young people in, in Accenture who are starting incredible projects that you sort of suddenly open the box and you go, well, how did that happen? And that wasn't driven by me or Julie or anyone else. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. And the one statistic that you mentioned that absolutely shocked me was that 20%, 6% of NDCs of national development climate plans have education in them. That is shameful. I mean, it, it, I mean that's something that absolutely must be addressed by COP and by all 195 governments. Education should be in every single one of the NDCs, without a doubt. There's no, no debate to be had about it. So brilliant research. Um, so yes, today, uh, I'm very pleased to say that, that Accenture will be supporting the Environment Prize, the Climate Change Prize, the, the, better, the, the World's Best Schools Prize. I think, um, so Vikas and I have a little bit of a history of starting prizes. Um, with Vikas having started the teachers, Global Teachers Prize that has gone on to be um, just sort of a social phenomenon uh, every year in terms of celebrating teachers as the real rock stars, as I think you put it to me the first time, which I totally subscribe to. In my case, 
um, inventing and coming up with the idea of the Circular Economy Awards, which hopefully has had a similar approach. And what I really like about what we're going to do together, and I hope uh, we're going to bring in other organisations like Salesforce, not to put Charlotte on the spot, but I think four or five other organisations that we want to bring in, because I do think coalitions are more powerful, um, uh, is really celebrate those schools, those teachers, those students who are doing inspiring things that can be repl replicated, that can be copied, and you made that point, Rebecca, that can be done um, again and again and again in other places. Rather than always pointing out all of the bad things, you know, actually taking those bright, sh you know, shiny um, spots of, of innovation, of, of energy, um, and actually finding ways to celebrate them and share them with others. So we're proud to be able to um, step up and help you, and we hope others are going to do the same. So th thank you so much, Peter. And if there was an audience, I'd ask for a standing ovation, <laughs> uh, as you know <laughs> this. You know, but the, the thing that I'm really impressed with with regards to support from Accenture is it's not just about money. You're also putting other things to play over here. So do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think so. One of the things that, that um, a lot of people don't know about Accenture is that we're the world's largest digital advertising agency. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of these campaigns, a lot of it is about creativity. It is about um, thinking differently about how you get at the message out there, how you celebrate, how you uh, identify these innovators, how you identify the best players, um, and putting our teams on that to help you with that. Um, and I think others can bring other skills from other parts of, of the corporate sector. But the other side of things as well, and we have Jill Huntley in the room, um, you know, we run an eco-innovation prize every year where very much bottom-up we encourage our folks to go out there and, and actually come up with ideas, practical ideas in their communities uh, that they can apply and that they can um, share with others that can be scaled at speed as well. And I think this concept is just such a brilliant one. Um, you know, education on climate in schools. I'll tell you some two final um, anecdotes. Uh, one is that I've been doing sustainability in one form or another for 24 years, and um, some of you will know Christina Figueres, who was the former Costa Rican president and UNFC C. and so I spent a year, my very first project was in Costa Rica, harnessing the geothermal energy from volcanoes, which I have an eight and 10 year old boy, which is other than the projects we've done with Lego, is still the only thing they think is cool that daddy's ever done. Um, and so there are different ways to motivate kids, but they are interested. And I do think this is something that touches everyone's lives. Um, and the other thing I will say is that what youth are calling for and what I've just mentioned, we've just done a survey of 1200 CEOs, it isn't that different. And I don't think it can be about pointing fingers at government and at business, even though I'm with Rebecca. I expect more from governments at COP than they've delivered to date. And I think that's a fair expectation. But I think um, when we spoke to CEOs, this is an amazing thing. In the last three years, the number of CEOs, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's definitely more than half that tell us during the course of an hour interview that their kids have put pressure on them and their families are putting pressure on them and asking, what are you doing? And so this is a very tangible way, I think, also for us as businesses to help our schools, to help our kids' schools to step in, to do something concrete, to share some of these innovations, and to hopefully inspire a generation of teachers, train the trainer, as well as students. Peter, once again, like on behalf of all teachers and all schools in the world, um, not that I represent them myself, <laughs> but I want to say a wholehearted thank you to you and to all the Accenture colleagues for partnering us with us on the World's Best School for Environmental Action, which is exactly what Rebecca and everyone has been talking about. But I would be remiss in not actually bringing forward David Mitchell, who is the headmaster of Danoon Grammar School, to tell us a little bit about climate action and how it works in his school. David, over to you. Thank you, um, Good afternoon, all. And as Bikas says, my name is David Mitchell, and I've been, had the privilege of being the head teacher of Danoon Grammar School for the, the best part of the last decade. I'm actually a former pupil of the school, and my own children actually currently attend. First of all, I'd like to thank Accenture and T4 Education for inviting our school to be involved today, and I hope you enjoyed the traditional Scottish entertainment um, at the opening of today's session, and a big thank you to all our young people involved. The Rune Grammar School is a state-run comprehensive school with a role of about 750 pupils, with only secondary schools serving the Cow Peninsula, a region of Argyll and Butte in Scotland, which consists of a predominantly rural demographic. The school's active vision is to be at the heart of our community where we are striving together to achieve excellence. And this vision is a key driver for our climate education efforts. 
and has had significant impact on both our curricular provision and pedagogy. Climate education has been for a considerable time a significant priority for the Rune Grammar School, and it is a key element of our long-term strategic plans steering our education provision. This is very much evident in the diverse range of experiences our young people are immersed in across all areas of our curriculum. And in our current climate education activities, it includes, for example, in science, our young people learn about the carbon cycle and how humans have disrupted this natural cycle, generating greenhouse gases and the impact of these. They can show through experimentation that CO2 has an exothermic effect. They interrogate statistical data to show the trend in CO2 production globally, and they appreciate the importance of leadership in tackling climate change. In our languages department, our young people are utilising resources from the Museo del Prado in Madrid, exploring how the landscapes and famous paintings will change if we don't act, and the social economic consequences of climate crisis. Our learners are also assisting a member of our staff who is providing interpreting services at, COP, at the COP conference by producing a quick reference vocabulary list, including technical terminology. The climate crisis has long underpinned much of the educational experience for our young people who attend our learning centre, which is our specialist provision for learners with additional support needs. They have written to all our world leaders encouraging action and made a short film to educate a wider school community about climate change. In our food technology department, our young people are examining how climate change is affecting our crop production, global food supply chains, our food prices, and our nutritional well-being. Young people are discussing the pressing need to make sustainable choices every day in the home environment, but also in the hospitality industry, including recycling, composting, avoiding waste, and climate-conscious recipes. Our extracurricular provision opens up opportunities for our young people to lead several climate initiatives. For example, they achieved the green flag status a number of years ago, and one of our young enterprise companies set up an upcycling business, which was a great success. But climate education is not a bolt-on, but it's truly embedded in our day-to-day -day learning and teaching. Not only do we raise awareness and knowledge of the issues, we provide opportunities for pupil-led action where our young people can be the proactive agents of positive change. And there's two key reasons why climate education is so central to our efforts. The first is, of course, the cause itself. We are acutely aware of how the climate emergency has and will continue to adversely impact our local, national and global communities. Our young people know that it's the most deprived in societies that are the hardest hit, and they're not prepared to sit idly by. And I'm amazed at the example our young people set us, how they are willing to adopt a social dimension to their efforts and to get their sleeves rolled up and take action. And the second is the opportunities for rich, active, experiential learning. Our school is growing a reputation for delivering immersive and innovative learning experiences for our young people within real and relevant contexts. We have received recognition for this. For example, the HMI inspector identified our experiential approaches to learning and teaching as best practice and planned to share our approaches with schools across Scotland. We were the first Scottish school to be awarded the JA Europe Entrepreneurial Award, and we were honoured to be the first Scottish school to present at T4 Education World Education Week last year, and we were again one of only 100 schools to deliver a session this year. Mike Kearney, the former governor of the Bank of England and now UN Special Envoy for on Climate Action and Finance, believes that climate action offers significant opportunities to the private sector, not seen since the advent of the internet in circa 1999. We want our young people to be at the forefront of this transformational change in our economies and society, and for what to happen, we need to ensure that we are giving the opportunities for them to develop knowledge, skills and competence right now. It is for this reason that we strive to establish creative forums where our learners can work together with our community partners to generate and develop ideas, but in a safe and supportive environment, one where it's okay to make mistakes, but one where our young people learn from such setbacks. This helps build leadership, resilience, and a real can-do attitude. This has revolutionised how we educate. Teachers are no longer the sage on the stage, but are now the guide by the side supporting our young people to lead creative initiatives to improve our communities while developing essential skills for learning, life and work. Skills such as creativity, problem solving, teamwork, communication, skills and risk taking. A recent example of this is in our new Game Changer course we introduced in August. We want our S1 pupils, our newest and youngest pupils, to be the champions of change as we navigate our way out of the pandemic. 
We want them to be the green shoots of renewal as we forge a better future for our school and wider community. They've already acted as local heroes, creating and leading a range of community projects to support different sections of society, for example, pre-5, school-aged children and the elderly. And they're currently working on a pioneering project called Climate Action in conjunction with our good friends, Apps for Good, a charity that promotes the teaching of computing science across the globe. Dunning Grammar School is one of only five schools chosen to participate in this pilot before the, before the full launch next academic year, which sees our young people generating ideas for technological solutions to climate change. And I'm delighted to welcome one of our S1 pupils round who's been working on the new climate action course. And I'm going to ask him a few questions about it. So, Rowan, what have you been doing in the new Apps for Good Climate Action course? We are looking at the causes of the climate crisis, mainly population and economic growth, and also possible solutions to the crisis, many proposed by Project Drawdown, such as reducing support for fossil fuels and channeling funds through renewable energy. We have been using simulators and models to see the impact of these solutions, and it's been interesting to learn that the one of them that has the biggest impact is the invention and use of better technology. We've been learning about current technologies such as IoT and machine learning that we can use to address some of the climate issues, and we are also improving our coding uses App Lab. We will shortly work in teams to come up with and develop our own technological solutions to the climate crisis and code proof of concept prototypes to show how these will work. It's important we apply systems thinking to our solutions, balance economic equity and other societal factors when coming up with our climate solutions. Sounds uh, amazing, uh, Rowan. So why is climate education important to you? Well, scientists tell us that we are at the tipping point and now is the time we really need to get ourselves sorted. Otherwise, our planet will be wrecked for us and for future generations. It's the poorest people in our global community that is affected the most. So we need to help. And obviously, do you? I'm going to ask you one last question, but do you prefer this active experiential learning versus the traditional learning that are in some schools? I definitely prefer working and leading on the many projects we do in class. It's much more interesting and fun than learning from books and listening to the teachers talking all the time. They still give us a nudge now and again, but actually doing things helps us remember better. Thank you so much for your insight and sharing some of your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you to, to Rowan there. Our young people now expect us, as you can hear, to provide them with opportunities to lead on key issues important to them. For example, our senior learners have six committees where they can lead on various issues that they feel are important to them. And one of these committees is dedicated to climate action. The great Irish storyteller Flora McCarthy tells a tale about a desperate man, so poor, so hungry, he left his family home to beg at a nearby town. Going house to house, he was met by constant rejection. Many doors were closed in his face as the householders responded in disgust to his plea for food and clothing. One day, in early winter, as frost descended on the town, the man slipped on the cobblestones and badly hurt himself, and a kind passerby took him to the local hospital. As word spread around the town about the man's fate, people started to descend to the hospital with food, hot drinks, warm clothing and money. That night, the man wrote a letter to his wife, it started, today a miracle happened, I broke my leg. I suppose the moral of this story is that we tend to wait until calamity has happened before taking needed action, even though the signs are there and in our hearts we know we should. For too long, too many well-meaning people have proposed vague action to the climate crisis. Mother Nature has been chapping at our doors, the floods, the droughts, the fires, but we have yet not got our own sleeves rolled up and taken definitive action. This is one, one area our young people can educate us on. They're not just the future, but they're the here and now, able and willing to make a difference. There has been much talk about climate anxiety of late. Research, recent research from the Bath University shows that 54% of us think our planet is doomed and we are powerless and that any action now is futile. Our young people certainly don't see it that way. And I know if they were given the chance, they would prove to be effective leaders of that transformational change we require. I have used the word action many times today, and I now have a call to action to all of you. I ask this of you. As soon as this session is finished, please contact your local school, nursery, primary or secondary. Discuss with them how you can actively involve their young people in your current projects and initiatives, particularly, but not exclusively, those related to climate action. We need you. 
We need you to help us provide the active, creative and experiential learning opportunities for our young people to grow so they can hit the ground running when they're your colleagues and bosses of the future. I promise you will not be disappointed by the inspiring and passionate contribution the young people will make. Show them by example the importance of considering the climate when making decisions so this becomes the norm to them. Let your school know what knowledge, skills and qualifications their young people need to be effective contributors to the climate economy. We recently introduced five new qualifications to address gaps in our own curricular offer to our young people. This was based on a recent consultation exercise with our local business community and their projected future needs. And I personally would love to hear from you too to discuss how the fantastic young people here at Durham Grammar School could contribute to your own current and future products. I'm confident they will challenge your thinking and present fresh perspectives. I'm lucky enough to benefit from that every single day. So please contact me at david.mitchell or guile-group.gov.uk and we'll share my email address later. But thank you once again to all at Accenture and T4 Education for inviting us to be involved today and indeed for all of you for taking the time to join us. You're now going to hear from one of our senior pupils, Jessie, who will share her views of the importance of climate education and why now is the time for us all to be compassionate, creative and courageous. And thank you again and enjoy the remaining essential sessions during COP26. Jessie. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Jessie Miller and I'm a fifth year pupil at Dunan Grammar School. And I'd like to talk to you about the importance of climate change education, not just for the children and young people of Scotland, but across the planet. Now, I'm no Greta Thunberg and my green credentials, aside from being a lifelong vegetarian, aren't any better than the next teenagers. There is plastic in my bin and sulfate in my shampoo. And whilst I do eat the odd plant, I don't really check that things go in the right bin. Um, but I think that's why we need to ensure that climate change is embedded in primary and secondary education. We need to make deep and meaningful connections between our actions and their impact on the planet. You know, do people like us really know what we're throwing away? That fag end that you tossed, that's 500 years to biodegrade. Even putting a drinks can in the wrong bin is 200 years. This is why we must be educated around the impact of our choices and actions. Start to buy cotton clothes, which only take months to biodegrade. Eat less meat, upcycle, buy vintage. But it's you, our leaders, that I ask to educate us. Because some of us might not care about what we throw away in the moment, but education can change minds and win hearts. If only we knew what the recent Australian study found, for example, that we each eat every day the equivalent of a Lego brick in hidden microplastics. And I think if we all knew things like that, we would be more inclined not to throw away plastic. We need to be educated also to understand that there is not really a way to throw rubbish too. Rubbish goes around and re-enters the food chain, and then we eat it. Young people and children have to know the impact of their lifestyle choices on this earth. This isn't just my opinion, and I think we've already covered this, but scientific evidence for the impact of climate change on education on CO2 emissions shows that if you manage to legislate so that a mere 16% of children in developed nations receive meaningful climate change education, CO2 emissions would drop by 19 gigatons by 2050. If you then manage to extend that education to a further 100% of students, the impact on this on emissions would outstrip that of wind turbines and solar power combined. So climate education must be a priority, not just here at COP26, but tomorrow and the day after that and the week after that. And you know, many of you might not be around to see the impact of our efforts, but you know, hopefully I will. And so will my friends and their children and the next generations of the world. I'm sure none of you here today need reminding that our future leaders, those who will inherit the responsibility for this planet, are today in schools and colleges and universities across the globe. And it's painfully apparent that the current and historic education has failed miserably in its attempts to educate our current leaders. I listened this week to the radio and I um, heard Professor Brian Cox speaking about his wish to send Boris Johnson and Joe Biden and their counterparts across the globe into space because he genuinely feels that the only way to ensure their understanding that without immediate systematic and sustained change our planet as we know it is doomed would be to send a space shuttle with our world leaders and send them into orbit 
so that then they could see the fragility of our earth and space. Now, I'm not a world leader. I'm just a 16 year old from Dunning Grammar School, but I don't need sent into space to understand that the time for talking is past and that the time for education and action is now. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. David, I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you, Vikas. And so that very much sounded like an application for the world's best school for climate action. <laughs> and what is your thought about the prizes? Uh, I mean, you as a school leader, how do you receive, um, you know, this unveiling that we've done today and, and of recent that you, you've been watching? What excites you about these prizes? I think um, it does really excite me. Um, all, all of the prizes really excite me. Um, and I think it's really important that as schools, sometimes all the great work that is, is done in education, um, it's not not forgotten, but it's not given the recognition it needs. And there are so many brilliant schools across this world. And you, you listen to World Education Week to hear that. Um, and I think, you know, to, to be able to recognise them with one of these prizes is, is just massive. It's giving shivers up my spine just now, actually. Thank you so much for that, David. I'm really grateful for your partnership and for you being here. And I look forward to seeing your application uh, come through because applications are open and all you have to do is go to worldsbestschool.org uh, and you will be guided through the process. And you have until the 1st of March to make sure you put your best foot forward for any of the five prizes. But as today we're at COP26, we bring a focus to the Environmental Action Prize. Thank you so much, David, and thank you to all the students of Danoon Grammar School. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Now, I want, to come, I want to come to you, Charlotte. You know, you've heard so much today. You've heard from Peter, who is at Accenture. You've heard from Rebecca Winthrop, who is one of the most profound thinkers uh, in this space. You've heard from a school in Scotland. Uh, it seems very appropriate. You've heard from this lady, who is a 16-year-old student of Dunoon Grammar School, saying, pony up, yep. like, let's have some action. So as a, as a global organization, you know, your commitment to the bridging this gap between education and the environment you know, is through the setup of what are called Climate Action Labs. Uh, can you share with us a little bit of information about this and how you're going to grow this movement, uh, most importantly? Because as you've heard, it's the here and now. It's not just about the future. And so over to you. So first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on one of my favorite subjects. Um, and that's how do we infuse all that we as a technology company do in enabling young people to have opportunities for the here and now and also for their futures. Um, and so it was with that in mind that in 2015 we started a partnership um, with the World Economic Forum and the Davos Middle School and the community of Davos. And the aim of that was to really showcase the power of corporate support in local communities and the change that that could really make. And we thought, well, let's do it at WEF, where you have some of the biggest companies and some of the, you know, the most known world leaders, and let's show them what can happen when a company gets behind a community. And so we started this program called Davos Codes, and it was with the 14 to 15-year-olds in the Davos Middle School, and it took us on this journey that you know, six, seven years later, I am so proud of that. And actually, it goes to what to so much of what we heard from both Rebecca and Peter. When we first started, technology in Switzerland, it wasn't a huge part of the curriculum. I'm so pleased to say that that has changed. And so we said, OK, well, what happens if we take technology, we teach the young students technology, but we also infuse that with... How do you use technology to tackle some of the biggest issues that we are facing from a societal perspective, but also from their local community? Because so many of the times when we speak about the SDGs, when we speak about climate action, when we speak about the need for change, we speak about it on a global basis, but we don't listen to young people when they're saying, well, that's brilliant, but how do I bring that back to my own community? How do I make change that I can measure, I can see the impact of, and I can go, this is what I am doing to make change. And so we created these climate action labs. Um, our first one was in Davos, and we started off very slowly. 
But the first point was to say, okay, Davos, what do you want these, this Climate Action Lab to be doing? What do you as the students want to be focusing on and what will make a difference to your community? And at that point, um, there was a lot of conversation about the lake in Davos, which for those that have seen, seen pictures or have been there, it's the most beautiful freshwater lake, but it's actually fed from snow that's bulldozed from the mountains. And so there was a conversation, is there plastic in the lake? Half of the town said, no. Half of the town said, mm, we need to find out. And so the students embarked through um, this partnership, we had them on experiments. We brought in partners. To Rebecca's point, there are so many NGOs and partners out there that are willing to support. So we brought in um, organizations like Nature Bites, uh, the Benioff Oceans Institute, and we had the young people taking experiments, taking measurements from the water, and then doing analytics on that. And they absolutely loved it because it brought to life all that we were talking about. It brought to life the SDGs. It brought to life their local community. What they didn't love was what they found and that there was a plastic content in that water. So the next stage of the journey, what are we going to do about that? It's no good just knowing. We have to have a plan around it. And so the young, young people of Davos, with full support from their school and their teachers and us, built out a whole campaign. They brought in local media, local business, the local government. And they brought a campaign to educate the community of what was happening around the lake. That campaign resulted in Davos having the only, been the only town in Switzerland that now has local regulations on plastic recycling, which is an incredible achievement for the young people. But they said, we're not stopping here. So the next step in the Climate Action Lab, we taught them all about single-use plastic. And actually, it doesn't have to be single-use. And we did incredible experiments with things like um, plastic uh, shopping baskets. What can, what can we do with them? How can we recycle them? How can we upcycle? We heard from the, from, from the noon. And that's led on this incredible journey where we are now, which is taking measurements from other environmental factors, air quality, flora, fauna. And one of the students in 2020 said, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could do these experiments at a flat baseline where we didn't have lots of traffic, we didn't have lots of air travel. Well, careful what you wish for, because then COVID hit. And of course, one of the positives of that was we did see a drop in travel. We did see a drop in emissions. And so the students from Davos, we continued the program, we continued the climate action labs, but we did it virtually. The other positive from COVID was that this meant that we could go global because it wasn't just about the town anymore. And so we brought in schools from India, from Japan, and from San Francisco. And we had them all doing these measurements, taking these metrics, and then doing their local analytics. But then we had each school teach the other schools about what they were seeing in their own local communities and in their environments, and building analytics all together to create impact that was then shared with the Swiss Institute of Allergy and Asthma Research. It's also been shared fully with iNaturalist and citizen scientists so that, to Rebecca's point, all of the impact that the work that they are doing is being recorded and they are seeing it at the local level but they are also seeing the impact at the global level as well. And so our next step is to continue the growth of the Climate Action Labs, take it into many other schools, bring many other partners in. We're looking forward to seeing how Accenture can help us scale that. But it's answering the question that every young person has said. How do I do my bit? I see Greta doing her work. I see Vanessa doing what she's doing. I see in other areas, you know, March for Our Lives. I, as a young person, want to do my bit. We heard it from the students there. And so the beauty of the Climate Action Labs is it's enabling every young student to do their bit, but then also to record their impact. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, I did know a lot about it because we've been to Davos and I think I've even been to the school. Yeah. Now the question really is in terms of like, you know, you have some great examples of Accenture and Salesforce joining hands and looking at the scale up of this. Uh, you know, what can other business partners or private sector partners do 
uh, in this sector? I mean, do you have any ideas or any, any advice for them? There is so much that corporates can do. I mean, we've, we've moved on now, and I think, you know, it's not just our companies. There are incredible organisations like this, such as, such as Unilever, uh, MasterCard, that are also showing the way here and saying, look, it's not about volunteering and doing a fence paint anymore. Businesses want to be engaged, and communities want businesses to be engaged. It's coming together, it's listening to each other and finding what, what it is that can link, what it is that's important to the business and important to the community, and designing, very often co-designing, a joint solution around how employees can become engaged with the community and how the community can be engaged with the employees. And that's when the magic really starts to happen. Communities are looking for the opportunities. We heard it from Peter. The business of business now is actually improving the state of the world. That's how we create value. Let's bring the two together. Because, as I say, that's when the magic can happen. That's when the change can happen. And there are so many partners out there that actually want to be part of that, that want to create those linkages, that want to create that change. And so the only thing that I would say to businesses, look, reach out, reach out to your peers, reach out to your communities and listen to what they're looking to do. And that's how you'll get involved. Um, I, just, I, I think that's brilliant. And, I, and the example is brilliant. And, and, and I look forward to working out how we scale it. I think the, um, I mean, I have a vision for us at least, and I think maybe it applies to you, that, out of our 626,000 people, and I've got that number wrong because it'll be six, six 134,000 by now, <laughs> the, the rate that we're growing. But, and, and I don't know the number at Salesforce, but it's 100,000 and something like that. It's more, more. 78,000. 78,000. Yeah. Uh, out of that group, I don't know what percentage of parents, but it's a lot. Yeah. Right? And, and the percentage of those parents that care about their schools um, is a lot. And if you think about empowering our employees, and this is some of the conversation we've been having through the Eco Innovation Prize, and to get that relationship building and that conversation going, that, that, and the toolkits to be able to actually replicate the interaction, like the climate labs for communities. I think that's one thing I would say. I think, you know, that, I think, we, I think we massively underutilize the passion of employees to go and improve their schools and communities. And we could structure that better, I think. That's one thing. And then, um, and then, uh, Charlotte, did you want to say something? Really? I was just going to say, I totally agree with you. We, um, at Salesforce, every employee gets seven days volunteering yeah. to go do whatever they want to go and do. We've got um, around about an 80% engagement rate, which is um, every, the, what we cast as full engagement rate is every employee doing two or more days. Yeah. So 80% out of 80 odd thousand is actually pretty good. Yeah. It's not where we want to be, but we're pushing yeah. them. Um, but really interesting, over 50% of all of those hours are to do with education. Right, right. And it just shows well, they get involved. Well, and it shows you the, the passion, but also giving them more structured tools. I just want to say one other thing, because if we, can, if we can give more structured tools that can be replicated, that have the sort of the insights of the Brookings Institute, have the institutes of where it's working like Dundun, Dundun. But I would also say one other thing about the reason for business to engage with educators. And, and you know, I think the T4 folks listening... I thought David made a brilliant point, which is he's preparing his students for the next era of jobs. Like back in 1999, and this is his words, talking about the dot-com era and preparing people for technology, a lot of schools missed out. It took them 10 years to catch up with what was required. Well, let me be clear. In Scotland, the North Sea will become one of the world's hubs for clean energy and offshore wind for sure. And the number of green jobs, even last year, at the last week at the Global Investment Summit, Scottish Power and Iberdrola announced a $10 billion investment in offshore wind in Scotland. This is where those jobs are going to come from. And so actually there is a, a, a commercial interest in working on those skills and those jobs of the future, I would say. Absolutely. And um, Prince's Trust actually just did a report recently. And in that report, it said 74% of young people right now want a job in the green economy. Yeah. Yet only 14% had been able to find either detail or opportunity in yes. the green economy. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I've been told to wrap the session. <laughs> I know that we've taken liberty here. 
But I want to say thank you, Charlotte. And, you know, uh, we all know about Salesforce's credentials in, you know, the business of business is making the world a better place. Uh, and I want to thank you for that on behalf of everyone for that. And, um, you know, we look forward to receiving more information about your Climate Action Labs and how, you know, schools in your network can also apply for the world's best school prizes. Mm -hmm. I also want to end by saying thank you to you, Peter, and all colleagues at Accenture. Your support means a lot to us because this is that, that divide that we're trying to bridge. This is exactly what this event is meant to be as well, which is this bridge between um, climate within the private sector and also now with the education sector. And, it, and it's, not, uh, it's not by mistake that this event actually takes place on the first day of COP. Yeah, exactly. We have a two-day slog, um, two-week slog now with regards to these negotiations. And we want to use this opportunity to impress upon every single person. And I'm going to use the same phrase I used at the beginning. No matter what the question, no matter what the question, education is the answer. With that, my friends, I want to thank you all for taking part. I thank Rebecca Winthrop, Danoon Grammar School, and both the speakers here today on stage for their participation and for their support. Thank you, and thank you for joining us.